to trust or not to trust? That is the question. We didn't trust it and tried to boycott it until the first light bulbs lit up the night. We didn't trust it and condemned it as witchcraft when we first stood in front of a camera. We didn't trust it and pointed to failed test flights before the airplane changed the world. We didn't trust it when we saw the first steam engine, when we first used machinery, when we built the first skyscrapers, when voices crossed the globe in milliseconds, when we used computers, when we heard about AI or 5G. Whenever new technology is invented, we always question, worry, and fear. Until we find the truth. Have faith in humanity. Design tech for good. The future is what you make. I guess it's mainly because of the lack of trust. People have said that 2020 is a year of mistrust. For me, personally, it's been a year of despair, but also of hope. What this has led to is a wave of what Joseph Schumpeter in 1940 called creative destruction. And as we've seen several times in the past 80 years since he coined that phrase, creative destruction always accelerates in a crisis. And as before, technology is again at the heart of this creative destruction. Over the past decade, social media has been a real boon for tens of millions of people around the world, connecting them in ways that we never thought possible. But it's also accelerated mistruths. Look at the realms of conspiracy theories such as QAnon that get started on social media platforms and then amplified unwittingly. In fact, fake news is 70% more likely to be retweeted and shared than true stories, and fake news travels six times faster than the truth. That's driving a really heightened level of scrutiny on big technology companies, especially those that provide the large-scale social, media, and infrastructure platforms that the internet runs on. It's safe to say that never in the history of technology has there been so much scrutiny and criticism, and in fact, mistrust of the role of technology in our societies. But while all this has been happening, the share prices of all the major global technology companies have been skyrocketing since COVID-19 started, with several trillion dollar plus companies being minted, because technology today is more relevant than ever before. And the creative destruction that COVID has accelerated is making us all more and more reliant on technology. In today's summit, my fellow presenters will walk you through a number of examples to show how technology and innovation can be a real catalyst for economic recovery and growth, and in fact, societal progress. But let me start by sharing some of my own experiences and observations from 2020. Here at WPP, we went from having an average of maybe 12,000 people per month on Microsoft Teams, to having the entire company, all 100,000 of us, 
on Teams every single day for several hours within two weeks back in March. We've replaced client workshops with virtual platforms like Miro, and I believe the outputs are often consistently better. And in the UK, more than half of all GP consultations have now moved to remote platforms. We've also started to adopt remote disease tracking applications, often using wearables for conditions such as diabetes, COPD, and even remote respiratory infection um, detection using applications such as ResApp. All of this is built around the need for ubiquitous, reliable broadband. And 2020 is probably the year when we've all come to recognize the importance of connectivity. We've had to rely on it for everything, and it's become like a fourth utility, something that our lives depend on in order to be fully connected to our world. It's an enabler of our future. To make technology serve the way that is good for society, we need to engage with technology companies, not restrain them. And we need to help embed humanity and more social responsibility into the technology so that we can all implicitly trust it. Human connectedness is what binds us all as societies. It's what helps us to understand each other, to resolve our differences, to stand in each other's shoes. I hope today's summit goes some way to restoring your trust in technology. Twenty twenty is what I like to call the Sputnik moment. It's the year that everything changed. Because we couldn't travel, we found alternatives. We found our new approaches to working, to schooling, to business, to healthcare. Air quality improved. We're experiencing the lowest carbon emissions in decades. The pandemic has forced a change in behavior. The realization that we can do things differently this is our Sputnik moment. But we can't do this if we don't have trust. The current geopolitical environment has created mistrust. And therefore it's impacting our ability to capitalize on the benefits of technologies like 5G, AI and cloud. And I believe the same is true right now, as it was back in 1957 when the Soviet Union launched the first Sputnik. Space travel, that was the Sputnik moment for the US. And I believe we've got it right now. In health, just have a look at what we've done. We've witnessed collaboration across borders. In Brazil, they're testing vaccines developed by Oxford in the UK in collaboration with the Chinese company. Competitors, fierce competitors, GlaxoSmithKline, and Sinfo collaborating jointly to get a vaccine out faster. Technology has helped us provide therapies. Technology has modeled how vaccines might attack humans. This is all about collaboration, collaboration between companies, collaboration across borders. Unfortunately, there are some countries who try to withhold technology to maintain their own strategic advantage. When I think about security and privacy, track and trace has been deployed for almost a year in some countries. And other countries still have challenges trying to figure out how to do it. For 10 years I've been talking about the value of broadband and connectivity. We know it increases the GDP, but governments now finally have a sense of urgency allocating the resources necessary to enable broadband and to accelerate 5G adoption. From spectrum discounts, reallocation of funds, creative business models, and actually driving industry transformation. That's never happened in the last 10 years. Unfortunately, geopolitics, the unreasonable pressure, I would say, that's being exerted by some governments as they realize and try to protect or prevent the development of technology outside their company, outside their country. And some are even eroding trust as a strategic approach. 
So these examples show the power and the strategic value of technology. It improves society, it improves the economy. These real life cases are why I call this, you know, a Sputnik moment, 2020. You know, mankind has a history of distrusting new technologies. In 1826, a group of uh, protesters attacked 21 cloth mills in the north of England. They became, they were worried about their livelihood because, you know, disruption to their jobs and things. They were called Luddites. I think you know the term, right? It's been around for 150 years. Now, misinformation is creating a lack of trust. And as Stephen just pointed out a few moments ago, mistrust is actually on the rise. People's unwillingness to trust is partly because governments and other trusted institutions have dealt inappropriately with technologies and companies in other countries like COVID and Huawei are being used as tools to manipulate public opinion. And the media, the media is also a key reason for the increased level of mistrust. Media influences people's thinking and their behavior. They print everything, fact and fiction, and there's no differentiation. The former prime minister in Australia, Kevin Rudd, is even attempting to investigate the bias of some media empires. I think that demonstrates this. So we have to end this cycle of mistrust. If we want to reap the benefits of technologies, benefits, vaccines benefit mankind. 5G benefits mankind. AI benefits mankind. You know, global collaboration will benefit mankind. There are real consequences of this mistrust. Misinformation about electromagnetic radiations, misinformation about security in the context of 5G has no doubt slowed down the deployment of this transformative platform. You'll recall, certainly I can, there were similar concerns when we launched GSM. Geopolitics is restricting the global supply chain and that has a negative impact on innovation and the ability for the world to achieve targets in healthcare, education and the environment. Now the jury may still be out on uh, the impact of AI or the impact AI will have on our jobs. But what's fact is that AI improves productivity and efficiency. It augments rather than replaces. Again, history has shown new jobs are created, this cycle of new technologies because of technological innovation. Climate action, another prominent Australian, Malcolm Turnbull, the former Prime Minister of Australia, he's issued very blunt and very broad criticisms of many governments for failing to take the science and technology of climate action seriously. So it's technology that's repeatedly proven to transform industries and grow economies. But it's always required collaboration. And that means trust. Now, if you think about quality of education, the United Nations fourth sustainable development goal, UNESCO in April this year has suggested that about 1.2 billion children were affected by school closures. And that's caused significant problems and challenges for the health, for the education industry. But again, access to broadband, access to technologies like Zoom, like Google Meets, using computers, using handphones, smartphones. We've demonstrated we can use this technology. We can have education anywhere. Of course, that requires trust in technology. And we've demonstrated the same in healthcare. We've used 4G, 5G, cloud-based AI solutions. We've demonstrated high-definition video-based consultation and remote patient monitoring. These are real solutions. Now, government and industry, they all realise the value of technology. The new behavioural norms, they demonstrate that if we collaborate, we can dispel this mistrust. Okay. Then the opportunities are endless. So every one of us has a part to play if we want to fix this problem. 
Governments need to take the lead and immediately dismiss conspiracy theories about new technology. NGOs need to support the lead of governments and businesses, they need to promote and use innovative technology rather than using misinformation to destroy competition because that leads to, that'll stifle innovation and that'll stifle growth. And then there's the media. They must act with integrity. They must act responsibly. It'd be lovely to see Google, Facebook, Twitter apply the same type of standards to technology conspiracies that they do to other types of misinformation. So I believe we stand at a crossroads. We can head down the path we seem to be treading, and that's where people mistrust everything, misinformation. Okay, what's that going to have? Isolation. Isolation, it disrupts the very fabric of our society. We can choose another path. We can choose a path that gives ourselves the opportunity for brighter, a more inclusive and a happier society. And that's the path I want to choose. As we've already heard, we've all been wrestling with economic, environmental, educational and health challenges in 2020. It hasn't felt like a great year, but technological developments, 5G coupled with artificial intelligence, analytics, digitization and automation, have the potential to change the game. So let's look at what 5G can do for us all. Our analysis forecasts that 5G enabled use cases, that is use cases that require 5G coupled with other technologies, could add $1.6 trillion to GDP in 2030. That's the equivalent of over $200 in the pocket of every human on Earth. We looked at eight industries in detail, and in conjunction with executives from those industries, developed a set of 5G enabled use cases, which we then quantified via surveys within each industry across developed and developing markets. We'll look at three industries in detail in a minute. But what is clear is that 5G can have a significant GDP impact in energy and extractives, that's oil, gas, mining, in manufacturing, in media, sports and entertainment, and in transport and logistics, where GDP increases range from 3.5 to nearly 5%. For example, transport and logistics can benefit directly from 5G in three ways. Firstly, by enabling better routing of deliveries and thereby reducing the percentage of vehicles running empty or with low capacity utilisation. By enabling drones and robots to be used to deliver packages over the last 100 metres or so, saving time and fuel. And thirdly, by enabling traffic infrastructure, traffic lights and so forth, to be altered real-time to improve traffic flows. But more efficient and effective traffic infrastructure also has a knock-on effect to other industries by freeing up time for commuters and employees. Some of that time will be spent productively and realise an additional 2.2% of benefits in those other industries. Nearly half of the GDP benefits we forecast from 5G in 2030 come from manufacturing. In part, that is due to the sheer size of the industry. It is, after all, 20% and 30% of the US and China's economic output, respectively. And 5G can also generate big changes in manufacturing. We identified three use cases which collectively account for around 600 billion of the $740 billion uplift we forecast for manufacturing in 2030. The first is Enterprise AR that is using augmented reality headsets to guide a worker via augmented displays and or a video communication to a remote expert when carrying out maintenance and repair tasks on factory machinery. The second use case in precision monitoring and control involves the real-time monitoring and control of robots, machine tools, even the end product using hundreds and thousands of sensors. For example, this might involve changing the speed of a specific factory process based on sensor information about vibration, temperature, or even the composition of raw materials. And the third use case, Advanced Predictive Maintenance, uses sensors to give an accurate, real-time representation of the status of a machine, so that downtime can be reduced by predicting problems ahead of time, 
so that maintenance can be scheduled at times that do not disrupt the factory. As you can see, benefits are very significant, particularly for precision monitoring control and enterprise AR, both of which cannot happen without 5G. Predictive maintenance already exists, and 5G therefore only offers incremental benefits. Indeed, our survey respondents believe that 5G could increase manufacturing output from precision monitoring and control by over 8%, although STL Partners has only assumed a 3% improvement in 2030 in our model. The COVID pandemic has resulted in significant increase in digital health solutions, and the telecoms operators have stepped up. In Australia, Telstra is supporting ICUs in 191 hospitals to manage demand and availability for beds, protective equipment, respirators and dialysis machines. When COVID-19 broke out, Hong Kong Telecom accelerated the launch of its new virtual consultation app, Dr. Go, which is currently available to all PCCW and HKT employees in Hong Kong. And this focus on health solutions has created a fantastic launch pad for 5G-enabled use cases, such as high-definition virtual consultations, the remote monitoring of patients with multiple 5G-enabled sensors, an ambulance connected to hospitals and specialist practitioners via high-definition video. The use of 5G enables existing digital health solutions to be scaled up and extended with substantial impacts on patient access and quality of care. By 2030, we forecast that 5G will enable hospitals to free up 4.2 million bed days, increasing global hospital bed capacity by 6%. It will enable nearly 900 million more patients to be seen by doctors and other medical practitioners, a whopping 15% uplift. It will allow ambulances to respond to over 40 million more emergencies allowing thousands of lives to be saved. And it will enable more than 13 million more patients to be treated in A&E clinics. The social and health benefits for developing and developed nations are truly exciting. Turning to the issue of fossil fuels and CO2, it's clear that 5G can help in the global switch to renewable fuels and green electricity generation. Use cases such as advanced predictive maintenance, automated control of renewable energy production assets, such as wind farms, drone maintenance and repair, and sensors to protect this production equipment, as well as digital assistance for field engineers are all made possible by 5G. These use cases can substantially reduce the production costs of renewable energy, bringing it into line with the cost of producing energy from fossil fuels. This alone will have a huge impact on how national governments plan their energy production and accelerate the move to green. Furthermore, the ability to track demand for and supply of batteries and electric fueling stations will also shift usage to electricity for vehicles and other heavy users of fossil fuel. And finally, millions of 5G sensors measuring both the production and consumption of electricity will enable the supply and demand for energy to be more effectively balanced. For example, where the demand for electricity is not time critical, it can be matched to green energy production by following the sun or wind, rather than creating excess demand, which requires the use of fossil fuels. The effect of this will be to make the world a cleaner, healthier and more sustainable environment. Our forecasts estimate that 5G could reduce carbon emissions by almost 1% in 2030. That's over 250 million tonnes of CO2 in that year, primarily by accelerating the use of wind and solar energy over fossil fuels. This impact over the period 2020 to 2030 is equivalent to almost 1.7 billion tonnes of CO2 emissions. That's approximately 64 coal-fired power stations plant emissions in one year, or half of all Canada's CO2 emissions in 2018. The opportunities for 5G are clear, but success requires commitment from governments, enterprises, and most importantly, the telecoms industry. Mobile operators need to commit to investing in and beyond the network to facilitate the collaboration required to build the ecosystems that deliver benefits in manufacturing, 
health, renewable energy and other industries. Moving to a vertical strategy also means CFOs need to allocate resources differently. They must reduce capital expenditure and redirect resources towards developing platforms and services that deliver value to other enterprises beyond the network. This in turn will require different performance metrics to manage the new financial and operational models. STL Partners estimates that 3% or less of revenue is currently spent on the activities associated with network independent service innovation, including R&D, service delivery, product and service marketing, customer experience management, analytics and so on. And this should grow to near 10% of revenue over the next 10 years as savings are made in network operations, sales and customer care by moving to digital channels and automating core processes. Senior management need to be committed, patient and persistent. Successful operators have combined both perseverance, in other words, continuous investment, and flexibility, pivoting and refocusing if things don't go right or the market conditions shift. For ambitious operators, 5G creates a tremendous opportunity to do and be more. An opportunity to generate more value for businesses and consumers. And now is the time for the telecoms industry to take the actions needed to realise that opportunity. We all know that technology has been the driving force between all quantum leaps and economic growth throughout history. 260 years ago, the steam engine changed the entire world, everything we knew, because it came along and gave us superpower manufacturing processes. Second Industrial Revolution took place at the end of the 19th century. Remember, we had new power sources such as electricity. We also had automobiles, radio, telephone. Then in the 1960s, it wasn't just the Beatles, it was also the invention and development of the microprocessor. That brought a whole new industrial revolution for all of us. When I was uh, a kid, you know, Britain had cars, motorcycles, merchant banks, steel. When I was a student at Oxford University, I, went, I arrived in 1964 and the sign said, Welcome to Oxford home of British Steel. It didn't even mention the university because it was such a major powerhouse in manufacturing then. All of that changed, everything changed. You know, although at the end of the uh, 18th century and the 19th century, in Britain, it was illegal to take designs for cotton processing machines and factories out of England. Somehow or another, the US got those plans the U.S. produced cotton, but it didn't know how to process it. The U.S. got the plans, learned from the British, and became a huge industrial powerhouse. Technology was open and shared eventually. In the 1830s and the 1840s, the Midlands, a few counties in the middle of England, had over 30% of the world's machines, a huge powerhouse. Well, the machine, the, the Americans learned, we learned to use those machines and we became a great manufacturer of shoes. And then we took over, started taking over from the British. In, in the 50s, we made cars, we made TVs, radios, but then along came Japan, which learned everything they could from America, including how to make aluminum, how to make steel. Then came the Koreans and many others. I grew up in America where we had Zenith TVs. I'm glad we don't have Zenith TVs anymore because other people can make them better and cheaper and they're more inventive with everything. Anybody taking a unilateral approach to anything, certainly to technology and economics, are going to be, have problems. Foreign policy should be around opening. History shows this over and over and over again. 
in the U.S., and I'm an American, so I don't like saying this, the U.S. is seeing more and more closing to the world. Uh, you know, we closed off to Trans-Pacific Partnership, which was opening to, uh, to the world. We closed off the WHO. We closed off the Iran Atomic Agreement. We pulled out of the environmental uh, process. Maybe it's good, but usually it's a sign of closing off, which is not so good. We also know about Brexit. Brexit is another sign of closing off instead of opening up. Now, we all need to open. We need to avoid protectionism, especially in technology. You know, if we go back 400 years, the British learned shipbuilding from the Dutch, and they then became perhaps one of the great superpowers of the last few hundred years. And then the British became the driving force for the Industrial Revolution and all that manufacturing, which we talked about before. I find it interesting that China's 12% of that, more or less 12% of their patents in the last few years have been co-created with other countries. In the contrast, the U.S., it's only 7%. Now, that's because many countries and companies are opening up more and more, and that leads to more powerful and potentially prosperous, potential prosperous for all of us. I want to say again, potential protectionism, especially in technology, is not good for the world, and it never has been. We all want to live in a period of prosperity and openness. Um, Huawei is a perfect example. Huawei was ahead of us, ahead of America in many ways, and then so instead of competing, Washington decided, well, let's just close them off. Let's just throw them off. Well, discrimination, especially in technology and in brain power, it always leads to an economic loss for all of us. So I know enough history to know that openness is good and the countries which close always have problems and go into decline. Uh, yes, competition is tough but competition always leads to new and better innovation and new prosperity. History is very clear about that. And the more we cooperate, cooperate with other people, the more we learn. Remember those 18-year-olds in the garage working on their computers right now? Let them learn. In very recent past, I find it very interesting that Beijing has very forcefully announced several times that it plans to open its economy and its open high quality technology even more and more to the rest of the world. And at the same time, they plan to strengthen IP protection for the world. Now, that is the way Be Beijing at the moment is reacting to all of this. It's certainly good for the world if they do that. Innovation and collaboration certainly can thrive and make everybody better. It, it leads to economic recovery and economic prosperity. You know, right now we have a, a, a virus and it's a good thing that we have technology and open technology because it helps, we've all been able to benefit from the technology and sharing technology. We know what's going on, we know who's doing what and how they're doing and what works and what doesn't work. So again, if all technology had been closed during this virus, we would have all suffered more and more than we did. And it's bad enough what we had to go through. Can you imagine if we didn't have broadband connections? My daughters are at school over the internet, uh, and many other people are. Many of us are learning and thriving and surviving because of the internet and what's going on. We can get our food ordered, we can have education, we can have medical attention, Technology has helped us in many ways during this period, and it's, it, it's good for all of us that we have more productivity and more new sectors opening up. Many of you have heard of fracking. Well, fracking didn't exist 40 years ago, but now we, America especially, learned fracking, developed fracking, but we have shared that, or other countries have learned from us and so that in academic research, we know about fracking and it caused, it's caused the production of oil and natural gas to increase all over the world. 
Is that better for the world or worse for the world? Fortunately, America didn't close off and hide its technology. The other parts of the world found it too. You know, Robert Solow, who was a great American economist, some of you have heard of him, did many studies, but one of his studies, and he estimated that technological change accounted for the great growth of the American economy and many other economies, and explains what it did for us and for others, South Korea, China. Many countries have benefited from the spread of technology and it helps them grow rapidly. Now, isolationism doesn't work. Speaking of Korea, it can be North Korea, which has been closed off, or South Korea, which has been open and shared technology and learned technology, and they have grown much faster than North Korea. We all grow much faster if we have the shared technology. We're probably going to have an economic hard time again in the foreseeable future, but I, I'm afraid it's going to be the worst in my lifetime for many reasons. But what will make it even worse and terrifying is if countries close off. History shows that if you close off and you have trade wars and you hide your, and you protect your, your economy, your technology, everybody is worse off. Please, the 1930s showed that if you close, you suffer. If you open, you, you develop and you prosper. So I am very glad to see that many places in the world continue to open up. The U.S. was very open to new technologies at many times in the world, and that made us more and more uh, prosperous. Uh, I hope we can learn from Huawei. I hope we can learn from the Chinese. There are many, many technologies we have to teach them, and many they have to teach us. You know, Alibaba, Tencent, all of these are companies which learn from us, but we learn from them as well. Right now, the Chinese are ahead of most of us as far as com computer money is concerned, cryptocurrency. Well, we can learn from that. Let's all learn from that. I don't find things like TikTok and Billy Billy a threat to me, and I know America, we're behind. And so we have resorted to saying national defense. My daughters love TikTok. My daughters love Alibaba. Uh, I don't see it's a great security threat. Washington says yes, but then Beijing can learn about the users. Well, listen, Washington knows everything I do if they want to. They can find out every phone call I make, everything on Apple they, is reported to them if need be. So don't think that everybody doesn't do it. And I would again would urge Let's open TikTok. Let's open Billy Billy to 12 year olds and 15 year olds so that we can have more synergy and more economic growth and more economic prosperity. Again, history is very clear. Collaboration and openness is the way the world prospers and grows. I don't have to, I hope I don't have to teach you all history, but that's the way we can all have a better life. I want my daughter, I, you, some of you met my 12-year-old daughter. I want her life to be open, free, prosperous, lots of collaboration, lots of growth, and lots of prosperity. Hooray. Hooray for more growth and more prosperity. And I am against closing. History is against closing. Please, let's open up. Thank you. Hello everyone, it's an honor to be here with you today and thank you to YWay for your kind invitation. My name is Stephanie Lynn Chabib and I am the Chief Marketing Officer of the GSMA. Today I want to talk to you about how openness and cooperation can build a strong 5G industry and deliver both business and social value. This year, the world has been rocked to its core. 2020 will be known in the history books as the year that changed everything. Our priorities and our beliefs, our day-to-day -day lives, how we work and what we work on, prompting all of us to stop and reevaluate. Every industry is now in a period of reevaluation, asking, does our understanding of our markets and customers still hold true? Do we need to readjust, resize, refocus? 
Yes, these are energizing, but also very challenging times to be in business. For the mobile industry, which has 5.2 billion subscribers and contributes 4.1 trillion US dollars to global GDP, the arrival of COVID-19 has put us on center stage as it's thanks to the business vision of this industry and the investment in robust and resilient networks over many years that provide us all with mobile connectivity now. And thanks, of course, to the role of the vendor community and the investment that continually shapes supply chain of the networks. Thanks to those networks, industries, organizations, and citizens in every country have taken an accelerated step into the future. So what does the future hold for the mobile industry? Well, the answer is simple, intelligent connectivity. 5G, together with AI, IoT, and big data, bring us to the era of intelligent connectivity, facilitating digitization across all industries. And same as with 2G, 3G, and 4G, the full extent of transformative value of 5G will only be apparent once it's actually rolled out. We've seen over and over new technology is launched, developers and inventors explore and test, applications follow, and consumers adapt. Over the next decade, we expect that a wave of mobile-led technology unicorns will be born from 5G, which will drive our future economies, just like the innovation that came with 4G. We believe that 5G will bring a big blue sky for business-to-business -business and business-to-consumer applications. And that importantly, 5G will enable enterprises and governments to further change society and impact lives. And the question on everyone's lips, will 5G also bring a revolution in the way we as consumers behave? We envisage that it will, just like 2, 3, and 4G did. 5G can certainly take services closer to the consumer, and they will be faster, more reliable, and more secure. So, what's the status on 5G rollout? Well, 2019 was pivotal for 5G. At the same time, 4G became the dominant mobile technology globally with over 4 billion connections. Today, 106 5G networks have been launched, both mobile and fixed wireless in 47 countries. 7% of connections are now on 5G and more than 205 g devices have been launched. Interestingly, more than 35 of the 106 networks are fixed wireless networks, boosted by the need for work from home solutions this year. A further 90 operators have firm plans to launch, made up half and half by European and Asian groups. Operators are expected to invest around 1.1 trillion US dollars worldwide from now until 2025, and roughly 80% of that will be in 5G networks. Of course, launching a 5G network requires a serious level of investment in R&D, and ideally, a solid set of industry fundamentals to be able to afford the investment, such as enterprise applications. In the five-year view, the US, Korea, Japan, China, and a few markets in Europe are leading, while the rest of the world is more challenged financially. This year, we've seen unexpected short-term challenges as the pandemic has slowed infrastructure rollout and the availability of handsets. And consumers too are becoming more aware of the potential benefits. It's interesting that consumers in South Korea, China, and the Middle East currently seem the most willing to upgrade to 5G. We forecast that 20% of the global subscriber base will have adopted 5G by 2025. With a few advanced countries at the forefront, the US at 50%, Korea at more than 50%, and Japan. China will have the single largest 5G base in absolute terms, although its penetration will be lower at 30% due to its large and dispersed population. And emerging markets are further out. We expect 9% penetration in LATAM by 2025 and 3% in Sub-Saharan Africa, where smartphone adoption and LTE transition are more challenging. So, what about human behavior? Well, we know that 5G will enable AI for online shopping, for clothes and furniture. If the experience at home is as good as, or better than, the store, we could see a spike in e-commerce. E-commerce is a major latent use case in some mobile-first markets like India and Africa, where existing smartphone adoption is below 25%. We also foresee further reduction in the use of cash, with more tap and go in all markets, with the significant growth of mobile money.
COVID-19 has already changed our behavior with online mobile education, mobile healthcare, social distancing, and contact tracing to help keep economies growing. Successful 5G leadership is all about priorities. Future spectrum and spectrum policy are priorities, as 5G as a critical enabler for national broadband ambitions. 5G connectivity for enterprise verticals is a priority, and how augmented reality and virtual reality can enable new services. To support 5G standalone business scenarios, the GSMA has published a series of powered by standalone case studies and 5G standalone implementation guidelines. And we've recently launched a 5G IoT for Manufacturing Forum, where we bring together tier one manufacturers and the mobile ecosystem to ensure we meet the requirements as we move to industry 4.0, which by the way, that's something that COVID-19 is accelerating. The GSMA has also created standard network slice templates that will create new commercial possibilities, such as low latency, high bandwidth, and high throughput, and the ability to support diverse services with specific performance requirements. And we are focused on multi-access edge computing to ensure that businesses get as close as possible to their customers by placing their services as near as possible and employing highly reliable, low latency connectivity for multiple applications. The GSMA supports collective industry positions that engender innovative and vibrant capability as we move into the 5G era that enables and supports many different services. And our working groups are continually supporting and enhancing global standards. Our vision at the GSMA is to unlock the full power of connectivity so that people, industry, and society thrive. The mobile industry will continue to do what it does best, invest in robust and resilient infrastructure so that the world can continue to adapt and evolve, innovate so that applications that we can't even imagine in 2020 will be driving whole economies in 2025, encourage unified standards and foster strong partnerships across the vendor ecosystem, appreciative of the continual pipeline of new technologies that are brought to market. The mobile ecosystem is the great enabler across whole economies, and we look forward to the future. We're building our future together with 5G. Thank you. The pandemic has hit the world hard and caught it by surprise. It shows how digital for every person, home and organization is highly needed, now more than ever. I'd like to explain where new ICT can help fight the pandemic and how digital and trust in tech can help us safely adopt to the new normal and go back to the office. COVID-19 profoundly impacts global, social, and economic operations. Digital technology can play a critical role in the responses. There is an active role for new ICT during this pandemic. 5G, AI, artificial intelligence, big data, cloud computing and other technologies all are integrated for innovation and have been applied in various situations. These technologies effectively support pandemic prevention and control but also support businesses and organizations going back into production. The pandemic progresses through four different stages. Firstly, it climbs and it grows explosively. Then it saturates to eventually decline. New ICT and trust in tech are able to support and bring value to each of these four stages. Gaining insights to identify the situation is crucial in the climbing stage. Supportive technology in the decision-making process and taking action is vital during the explosive growth. Countermeasures support the saturation stage. And economic stimulation packages and social involvement help recover when the number of cases are declining. In the climbing stage of the pandemic, we can recognize there are more cases 
than hospitals and resources can actually deal with. New ICT can support with online and digital hospital services, and intelligent ICT infrastructures guarantee a swift rollout and availability of digital and online hospital services. During the explosive growth stage, it is eminent that contacts between doctors, staff, medical specialists and patients are minimized to reduce the risk of spreading and prevent cross-infection. But in this stage, collaboration between medical specialists is so highly needed. Digital technology and intelligent connectivity make it possible for medical specialists and healthcare teams to collaborate and share information across their teams and departments without the risk of physical contact. The same goes for doctor-patient contacts. Talking about artificial intelligence, what about AI-enabled drug screening to accelerate new drug development and shorten its time to market? Here's another example of how new ICT is a crucial part of critical infrastructures. Long-distance clinical collaboration between experts over 5G. Earlier this year, on February 18th, Doctors used the 5G network to operate an ultrasonic robot positioned next to a patient's bed in Wuhan Huangpi Temporary Hospital, mind you, 700 kilometers away from where the actual medical specialist team was positioned, to conduct a thorough expert examination. Artificial intelligence, AI in this scenario, further assists throughout the process, for example, in the discovery of suspected cases. AI also optimizes the process from patient registration to generating and examining medical images, create diagnoses, and help automate reports. Throughout the world, we have numerous examples of cases already fully engaged with all these capabilities and scenarios. The pandemic opened the door for new ICT, and it's clear that with trust in tech, we can close the door of the pandemic. We can't afford to take the wrong direction. We are at a critical time for humanity and for everyone that lives today and in the future. Globalization is at the crossroads. This could be the best century ever for humanity, but it could also be the most dangerous. The choice is ours. We have to make the right decisions. We have to overcome the fragmentations, the geopolitical tensions, and the big threats we face, like climate change, like pandemics, and many others. And we can do that by working together, by cooperating, by ensuring that we work together using technologies to overcome the biggest threats that humanity faces. This has been achieved in the past. The past 30 years have seen more progress more rapidly than any time in history. And that's because there's been a technological leapfrogging. We've overcome digital divides. We've learned how to live better together. There is no wall high enough that will keep out the big threats we face, be they climate change, pandemics, financial crises, or others. What those threats do is they undermine our ability to make progress. They lead to slower growth, to less jobs, to less prosperity, and we cannot solve the big problems like climate change or pandemics if we work against each other. So we have to work together and we have to understand that technologies provide a means to do that. What we've seen in the pandemic is digital connectivity allows new opportunities to connect with our loved ones, with businesses and with others so we can carry on. And that's even more the case in the future. By harnessing technologies and working together, we will be able to ensure that we create a more prosperous world, a world of better understanding, a world where young people today have a bright future. 
So the choices are ours. What we've seen in supply chains, what we've seen in other areas, is the slowing down of progress because of rising nationalism and protectionism. This does not need to happen. There is no need at all why we need to go down the dark road. We want to go down the bright road to a better future. We want to ensure that we create the jobs, the incomes, and share them globally. That we have a more inclusive globalization, a more sustainable globalization, a globalization that brings jobs, that brings incomes, that brings ideas, by using technologies around the world. And by working together, we will create a most magnificent world, a world of shared prosperity, a world where the future is brighter for the young people today. So we face a big choice, a crossroads moment. And my hope is that we go down the road that will lead to a more united world, a world of greater progress, a world where we overcome our difficulties by working together. The choices are the ones that we have to take. Ever since the discovery of fire, the introduction of agriculture, and the invention of the steam engine, people have lived longer and better lives. Technology has expanded our human intellect, has extended life itself, and created a modern society. Technical progress is actually the only factor that can sustainably drive income and raise people's living standards. For the millennia that leads up to the first industrial revolution in the 19th century, economic growth was pretty much for all civilizations basically zero. But with the arrival of the industrial revolution, human beings could raise their living standards by 75% within a human lifetime. Such is the power of technology. What is different about today's technology compared to yesterday's technology? Well, first there is the speed and the scale, the vast technological diffusion across all societies and across all segments of society. What is also different about today's technology is that it connects people, it builds a network, and it strengthens a network, and it makes the network even more powerful. It makes people who have ideas make the ideas even more valuable. It makes countries with resources even more efficient. With a stronger network, ideas become even more powerful. Resources become even more valuable. Technology is the network and technology can only advance with expansion of the network and the depth of the network and with countries and people collaborating with each other. That is the only way to push technology forward. Now the greatest companies in the world are those that solve society's most basic problems. The most meaningful kind of technologies are those that can help the most vulnerable segments of society. Thanks to technology, our lives were not as miserable as they would have been during the pandemic in the absence of these technologies. But this raises a new question. If society is gonna welcome a new digital era, there are open-ended questions and that requires countries to work together to solve them. Technology often outpaces society and regulators. Along with innovation comes a new set of questions, potentially a new set of challenges. How do we think about regulating financial technology? How do we think about connecting the world with this new type of infrastructure? How do we think about some of the most fundamental problems, which is reducing uh, inequality, alleviating poverty and fighting climate change, and when the time comes, working together to prevent a financial crisis that can sweep across all nations 
these things require collaborations. There is no way that countries can do it alone. Why? Because these are transnational problems. They're not nation-specific problems. And so this gives rise to open exchanges of knowledge and open efforts for collaboration because different countries have different set of experiences. There's human capital, there is the ability for goods, knowledge, uh, capital, all of these things to flow across nations. Because technology is network and technology builds on past technologies and technology spur new technologies and it's based on basic research and science, this requires the collaboration of academic institutions around the world, requires collaborative research, uh, academic programs to push forward knowledge because only with advancement of knowledge can technology advance and only with advancement of technology can human lives advance, can people's incomes grow, can poor countries dream and aspire to become rich countries one day. What technology has done is to create that network, to link countries together and to link people together. We are living in an age of network that is powered by technology. Now this, this has changed how we think about global and international relations. It's less about competition and rivalry and substitution and much more about collaboration, about complementarity, about cooperation. The most successful country in the 21st century is the country that is the most connected component of that network. The objective of living in the network is not to dominate the system, to be a hegemony, but it is one that wants to preserve and protect that network, to sustain that network. That is the defining characteristics of a new leadership. I hope that everyone will realize that in this day and age, one country's wealth begets another country's wealth, and one flourishes because everybody else flourishes. We need to be sending the right message for the new generation. Everybody of that young generation has the right at fair opportunity to achieve what they want to achieve and to realize their dreams. But this can only happen in a harmonious and open environment where countries work together and governments collaborate and where young people can choose to go to other countries to learn and to have knowledge exchange. What is the fundamental factor of advancing science and technology is that openness, is that creativity, which can only flourish in such an environment. So we need to be sending the right message and enable an environment where the young people have trust in their government, in their institutions, and with each other and in society. Because after all, they are the enablers of technology. They will power the technology and they will make technology work for society. In the end, it's the young generation that will be our hope for a brighter future. Hello everyone, welcome to the 2020 Trust in Tech Summit. Throughout history, technological advances have pushed the boundary of human knowledge and enriched our lives. However, every time when faced with a new invention and innovation, we have encountered a certain level of panic and uncertainty. This lasts until we begin to enjoy the benefits. Why should we trust the power of technology? Because technology is a tool for expanding our capabilities to improve our lives. When we embed our vision for a better life into technology, its advances are for good and they are the key driving force that will accelerate social development. Innovative technologies 
have helped us address challenges we have never encountered before, like those we are facing in 2020. The ICT industry has played a key role in this process. It's becoming critical digital infrastructure that supports people's well-being and economic development. COVID-19 has created many new requirements and application scenarios. Many economic and social activities are moving online. In Cambodia, remote consultation systems allow medical experts from different regions to fight the pandemic together. These systems have solved medical resources shortage in the hot heat area in Philippines and Panama. AI-assisted systems help hospitals quickly screen and analyze medical cases. During the pandemic, schools have had to close. In Kuwait, thanks to 5G CPEs, children are able to continue receiving high-quality education remotely at home. In the aftermath of the pandemic, society must return to normal, recover economically and find new growth opportunity as soon as possible. Traditional industries can use 5G to achieve digital transformation. Injecting new vitality into their businesses, 5G can improve people's well-being, boost productivity, and help explore new business scenarios to create new value. In the next 10 years, 5G is set to increase GDP by 1.4 trillion US dollars. Some companies have already started exploring the potential of 5G. In the mining industry, working conditions used to be extremely harsh and the productivity was quite low. One coal mine in Shanxi province in China has deployed a 5G network 534 meters underground to remotely control and inspect mining machines. This makes operations safer, reduces the number of underground workers by half and boosts productivity. In the port industry, operators had to control gantry cranes from 40 meters in the air all day long. Huawei has worked with the port of Ningbo in China and used 5G to control these gantry cranes remotely. This has made the work environment much better and increased productivity by fourfold. In Singapore, Huawei Cloud provided a health checking system for local SMEs like seven networks to help them restart their operations. We can see that when we bring humanity into technology and use it to envision a better future, new technology can bring us true value to rely on. As we near the end of 2020, I want to stress that Trust and collaboration are the foundation for maximizing and sharing the value of 5G. Where 5G has been commercially deployed at a faster rate over the past year, we have heard some voices and rumors around 5G and its innovations. For example, some say the metal straps in medical masks are 5G antennas. They say virus could be tracked or even get cancer. Others say the radio waves sent by 5G base station can damage the immune system. As a result, 
hundreds of base stations have been damaged. There are even rumors that 5G will breach personal privacy. In some regions, people have protested against 5G. Such rumors and panic are not surprising. New technology has always been met with this mistrust and fear in its early years. Machines were first used in factories during the first industrial revolution in the early 19th centuries. They were met with the panic and opposition from workers. In 1811, a man named Lud began smashing machines in Nottingham. That started the Ladat movement against mechanization. Handloom workers then destroyed many factories and machines. Machines actually created more job opportunities, so the movement quickly ended in 1816. Again, in the 1850s, many advanced technologies were introduced to China from the West. Many people in China mistrusted them and spread rumors. They said cameras would steal your soul and electricity poles and railways will disrupt feng shui and disturb natural ley lines. As a result, people pulled down telegraph poles and destroyed railway tracks. Such concerns are common when innovations first emerge. As humans naturally have concerns over new things. However, what is worse at this critical moment when 5G is growing fast is the increasing mistrust between regions. Given the current complexity of geopolitics, countries are becoming more isolated and conservative. Meanwhile, we see politics stand in the way of technology advances. A few organizations are trying to divide the world into different camps through technology decoupling. They do this to ensure they maintain hegemony and absolute interest in technology. These factors have created more mistrust in global collaboration and innovation. This worries me because it's more difficult to rely on global resources for innovation and the collaboration is being obstructed across the value chain. This will prevent us from realizing the value of technology and the slow economic recovery. In 2020, 5G technology has matured and profoundly changed all industries. Now it's very crucial to face the changes in trust and collaboration and uh, proactively work to address them. The entire industry must work closely together to unleash the value of 5G in vertical industries as quick as possible. To address the mistrust, we need an ecosystem built on mutual trust and collaboration. This ecosystem will require efforts in three areas. The ICT industry, cross-industry collaboration, and the business environment. First, we call for the ICT industry to continue adopting unified technical and security standards. The 5G standard is the first unified communication standard in mobile industry. This will benefit the industry, governments, and consumers. We also call for unified 5G security standards. 3GPP and GSMA 
have jointly launched the Network Equipment Security Assurance Scheme, or NASAS. It provides stronger protection for personal privacy and cybersecurity. Second is cross-industry collaboration. Vertical industries must embrace new opportunities brought by 5G. 5G is providing vertical industry with new capabilities, and 5G standards are now actively addressing industry needs. For example, Release 16 and Release 17 have added improved standards for broadcasting services. Release 18 will define the architecture for 5G smart grids and explore how 5G will support services like remote control and protection. Research on 5G standard for healthcare is also underway. This will help standardize industry development and promote more innovative medical applications. Third, we need to create a favorable business environment. The current complex geopolitical environment is having a negative impact on technology. We believe that politics should stay away from technical issues. We need to remain fire and open to drive collaboration. Industry cooperation is not a zero-sum game. If an isolated approach is adopted now, where new technology is unlocking social and business value at a faster rate, the victim will not be one company. Many industries will suffer, and economic recovery will slow. To create a thriving ecosystem, the tech industry must remain open. In addition, it's essential to build mutual trust as this will lay the foundation for steady global progress. The golden age of 5G has arrived, so we must strive to remain open, enhance trust, and collaborate for shared success. Only by working together can we drive economic recovery and sharing the benefit brought by technology. Technology has always led to more prosperity, more happiness, so let's hope we can all trust technology to lead us forward to more prosperity again. Light up, crystal ball, as the world opens up.